everyone. We thank you so much for joining us for Bible study. Our scripture tonight will come from Revelation 11, chapter, verses 16 and 17. And it reads, And the 24 elders who sat below God on their thrones fell down on their Father God, for we do not deserve it. We thank you for your grace, Father God, for it could not have happened without you. We don't deserve it, Father God. We have not made it. We have not done the things that are pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins and mold and make us, Father God, that we will hear your word. Lord, we ask you to speak tonight. Bless us by way of your word, Father God. Let us know, Father God, that we, as we walk with you, you will bless us. And bless us, Father God, that we will study your word, that lives will be made the better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Himself. Amen. And because he's God all by himself, he's just given us another chance. Not a chance that we deserve. He's just giving us one more 
one more chance. If he doesn't do anything else, thank God for this chance. Amen. Are you thankful for this again? Another opportunity, another chance to praise him and to worship him. We are in Acts chapter 10 tonight. Our pericope is Acts 10, 1 through 8. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. The Lord is moving by way of the Christian church. Um, the church at her birth was the church at her best. Amen. The church at her birth was the church at her best. Amen. The church at her birth was showing us how we ought to do church. If we do church the way the early first century church did church, we would really have some church. Amen. We would walk with God and miracles would break out and God would be seen all over this world if we just follow the movement of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, we have another character tonight. Last week we looked at Dorcas being made whole. What was wrong with Dorcas that she needed to be made whole? Dorcas was made whole. She was dead. She was all the way dead. She was no movement dead. She was no breathing dead. She had no blood circulation dead. Dorcas was all the way dead. Then what happened? Peter came by, brought her back to life. The Spirit of God moved. She arose. Her eyes opened. Peter helped her. She sat up. And Dorcas was brought back to life. Amen? Amen. Who was Dorcas? What did she do? Why did she know it? Why would we even name a mission circle after Darkus? What was Darkus known for? Good work. For, for a charitable deeds, a good work. What was Darkus' name? Tabitha. Tabitha, right? How many of you know a Tabitha? Do you know more Tabithas than you know Darkus? <laughs> not, not that Tabitha. <laughs> You know more doctors than you know Tabitha, or you know more, more Tabitha than you do doctors? New King James calls her Tabitha. King James calls her Tabitha, but she, they also call her doctors. So Peter is in Joppa. Peter is in Joppa. And he's spinning, as we came to the final verse of last pericope, we noticed that Peter stayed in Joppa with who? Simon the Tanner. Simon the Tanner. So here it is. Simon Peter staying in jo in Darkus, I mean staying in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. What is a tanner? Boy, y'all got some questions on the test that y'all just gotta pass tonight. What's a tanner? It's not that, that machine that you lay in and get darker either. It's not a tanning machine. It's not what 45 need to lay in for three hours. It's not a tanning machine. What is a tanner? He, he, is, he is staying with, living with, hanging out with, in Joppa, with Simon. Simon Peter is hanging out with Simon the Tanner. And people didn't like to see Simon the Tanner showing up. Why? Because Simon the Tanner was an undertaker. Oh, I knew you would say that. I knew you would say, oh, yeah, I, I was about to say that. Have you all, have you all seen a, a guy that walks around and questions people about the Bible named Topha? He's from Philadelphia, Mississippi, named Topha. 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 He walks around and he questions people about the Bible. He's a rapper in Mississippi, Philadelphia, Mississippi. His name is Topha. T-O-P-H-E-R. T-O-P-H-E-R. His name is Topher. And every time he stops somebody, he says this. My name is Topher. I go around questioning people about the Bible. And if you answer all three questions, I'm going to give you $100. <coughs> so he, he makes money as a Christian rapper. And he uses that money to walk around and question people. Right now, he's on, on the University of Mississippi campus. Last week, he last month, he was on the University of Southern Mississippi campus, and he's questioning college students about the Bible. How successful do you think that is? 
smart college students, they got to know, right? But anyway, what happens is when Tofa get through questioning them and then he gives them the right answer, they would, say, they would say, I was about to say that. They would say, that was right on the tip of my tongue. I was about, I thought about it, but I just didn't say it. But remember, Tofa says, I ask you three questions. And if you answer all three, I will give you a hundred dollars. He ends up saying, I didn't say if you answer all three right. You just have to give an answer. He's just giving money away. And the purpose of it is to make people more apt to read their Bibles. And if he walks up and there are five people in the group, he gives away $500 right there in five minutes. So when I go back through Jackson, I'm going to stop down through Philadelphia, Mississippi and look for Topher. And if we would pay for gas half of the piece away there, one quarter of my trip would be paid for by Topa if I answer the questions. So the people always said, I was about to say that. That's good. So Simon the Tanner is who Peter, Simon Peter is spending time with. We closed out chapter 9 of Acts by talking about this. And we move now to chapter 10 of Acts. In chapter 10, there's a new character there. And I know you prepared for it. I know you read ahead, like all good students do, especially Bible students. The character in chapter 10, the first eight verses, is called Cornelius. Cornelius is the character, is the main character here. So Simon Peter is in Joppa. Cornelius is in Caesarea. It's about 33 miles, 30 to 33 miles apart. And they didn't have Cadillacs and Lexus and Jaguars. It's about 33 miles apart. As we come to the end of this pericope, you'll see why I mentioned they didn't have cars. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Who's the main character in this pericope? What's the pericope? What's a pericope? Complete thought. Complete thought. Okay, so what else is a pericope? What else is a pericope? One complete thought? What else is a pericope? Paragraph. Paragraph? But the Bible wasn't written in paragraphs, right? Matter of fact, the Bible wasn't written in chapters. It was on a stroll. It was on a wall in the cave. And it was one continuous scroll when they got to scrolls. It was one continuous stroll. So the, the editors and the interpreters put it in chapters and made pericopes out of it. So it gives us one complete thought, one particular avenue to look at scripture. So there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. He was a centurion. He was of the Italian regiment. What kind of person was Cornelius? He was a leader. He was in the Italian regiment. Historians say he led about 100 people. He was like a sergeant in the army or a sergeant on a police force. He led about 100 people. And he was, he was leading 100 out of 600 people. He was the sergeant. He was the leader. He was a devout man. He was a devout man. He was a devout man. What does devout mean? He was a righteous man. He was a devout man. When we hear the word devout, we think of Job. Job was a devout man. He was a righteous man. So Cornelius was a righteous man. And then he says, he was a man who feared God with all of his household. He, he was the devout, righteous man. He feared God alongside his old household. So Cornelius was one. He was, he was a 
Old Testament fellow who followed the Old Testament, but he was New Testament saved. Anybody in the house? He was an Old Testament guy who followed the Old Testament, but he, his salvation came by way of the New Testament. And I say New Testament because that's how we know it now. He had salvation. He had received Christ. He was a devout man and all of his household was devout. All of his household feared God. All of his household was righteous. What does that say to us today? I told you the church at her birth was the church at her best. What does that say to us? What does that indicate to us? He was devout. He was righteous. He was God-fearing, and his household was God-fearing. He trained his household. We ought to train our household. We ought to have folk in our house who believe what we believe. People in our families ought to believe what we believe. We can't make them believe, but we have to be evangelistic and put it out there. So he feared God. He was righteous, meaning he was devout. And his whole household was too. The Bible says with all his household. Another thing we find out about Cornelius is that he gave arms of generosity to people. What does that phrase mean? He gave arms. Somebody other than Sister Davis. He gave arms. He gave arms. What does that mean? A-L-M-S. He gave, yes ma'am. He gave alms. What does that mean? He gave alms. He gave money offering to the poor. Okay, he gave money. You did your background reading or something? He gave offerings of generosity to the poor. He he helped. He was on a missionary journey. Remember, we talked about mission for the last three weeks. He was he was a missionary. He gave alms. He gave offerings. He helped out the poor. What does that say to us? We ought to help out the poor. Yeah. We ought to help those who are needy, not those who are greedy. Mm -hmm. I think I said it again. When we give alms, we ought to help the needy, not necessarily the greedy. My philosophy is people buy what they want mm -hmm. and they beg for what they need. What did I just say, Brother Whitlock? They buy what they want, but they beg with what they need. What, what am I saying? Thank you, Brother Whitlock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this Brother Whitlock, then Sister Whitlock. <laughs> Sister, Sister David Whitlock. <laughs> brother Whitlock, what, what am I saying? What am I saying? People beg for what they need and they buy what they want. Or they buy what they want and beg for what they need. What am I saying? What did Sister Davis say? She was about to say. Oh, oh, you got, oh man, got telemetry going in here. She was about to say that they uh, pay for their nails and their hair to get done, but they uh, beg people for food and, and rent money. Amen. So they beg, they beg for what they need, they pay for what they want. Sister Davis, what were you about to say? They'll pay for things that are necessities, but because you can't, people will help you with necessities, help you buy groceries, help you with your lights, but they're not going to give you money to get your hair and your nails, and you, you need to put your priorities. Okay, so people do not prioritize what they need, exactly. but they do know if you got you have a light bill due, mm -hmm. they do know if you're about to go to jail, or they do know you need these things. Mm -hmm. What, I, what I've never understood, though, is that a brother who don't pay child support can afford to pay to get out of jail, but he couldn't afford to pay child support. A brother, I can't understand, a brother who, who steals because he needs something or he wants something, he can, he can pay for bail before he's locked up. You know you can pay your bail before you get locked up. When you go turn yourself in, the reason why guys get out in 10 months, I mean 10, 10 hours, is because they pay their bail or pay their bond 
before they go in, so they process them and it takes 10 hours for them to get out or six hours or whatever, depending mm -hmm. on how backlog, back, 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 um, backlog they are, right? So people will pay for stuff. One example is nails. They will pay for hairdo. They'll pay for nail, toenail, manicure, pedicures. They'll pay for makeup. Because they know if they tell you they need some food, they are not going to worry. You're going to help them buy some food. Yes? It depends. It depends. It depends on what they're standing on. I see. And then the other thing is, how many times have you come to me before and you were in dire need? Now we got to do a budget. I mean, we got to. We got to put it together. We got to sit down at the table together. I mean, the second time, Sister Brown, we got to sit down at the table and talk about income, and we're going to have to talk about tithes because you got to get 10% off the growth in order to be blessed. Yes. Then we got to talk about the necessities of life. You may have to put your hair in a bonnet for a while. You can't spend $120 every month or every six weeks. Yes? yes? Or you may have to cut your hair for a while. I have not paid for a haircut in many, many years. And when I, somebody else was cutting my hair, my wife cut it one week and my daughter cut it the next. I probably still owe them money, huh? Yeah. They were devout. The household was devout. The household was righteous. The household feared the Lord. The whole household. It is a blessing when you have a child or a spouse or a neighbor around you that fears God. It is a compliment. It is a compliment to every single parent when their children love the Lord. It says much about the parent when the parent took time before they were born praying over that baby while he was yet or she was yet in the womb uh, quoting scriptures over that baby because if it is a baby you got to put it in them before they're born. And when then once they hit planet earth you have to make sure you continue to put it in them. You have to put it in there. Put it in there. A child left to himself will go to destruction. You don't have to teach a child how to cuss. You don't have to teach a child how to steal. But you have to teach them how to love the Lord. They come here stealing. Don't touch that and touch it anyway. Lead or don't check your hand, put your hand in that cookie jar. And every time they get caught with their hand in a cookie jar. You don't have to teach that. And then even at the age of one minus two months, they look at the cookie jar and wait till you, you turn your head. Or they look at the vase and they wait till whatever caused their curiosity. They look at, they look at it, then they look at you. They already stealing. You don't have to teach them that. But you have to teach them how to love the Lord and how to fear him. The Bible says Cornelius taught his household. Or he, the Bible does say that all of his household feared the Lord. He was a devout man. And I guess he came to the same conclusion that Joshua came to. Now you can choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. For us, this is what we're going to do. We're going to serve. We're going to serve the Lord. He gave arms generously to people. He wasn't stingy with it or stingy with it. He gave freely. He gave generously to people who needed it. He gave money. He gave clothing. He, he did the missionary work. Wherever there was need, 
he gave generously to the people. Look at what he does. And prayed to God always. Let me tell you, you got to pray to God when you're doing good and pray to God when you're doing bad. And let me tell you something about prayer. When you pray, God is talking to you and you ought to be talking to God. The problem is, we don't have a problem with talking to God, but we got a problem with listening to God when we do decide to pray. So prayer is a dialogue. Prayer is also us asking God, what do you think about it? God, what are you saying in the midst of it? God, what are you doing? Have we ever asked God, God, what in the world are you doing? God, you up there? Have anybody ever asked him other than me, God, are you still there, God? God, I, sometimes you ought to tell God, God, I want you to stop me from my foolishness. But you got to be humble to do that. God, I'm climbing up fool's hill again. You might as well be honest with him. God knows. <laughs> he knows everything. So you might as well be honest with God. Tell God, always tell God what you're thinking about doing and ask God, God, here I am, fix me. A lot of times we have awkward people. If we would just stop focusing on those people or that person and go to God and say, God, fix me. God, change my heart. Show me how to deal with them. I mean, you got to get to a point sometime where you, after you praise God, after you've honored him in your prayer, after you've asked his will to be done, after you have, have blessed the name of God, you need to say, God, here I am. I messed up again. God, I, I've done it. Lord, I knew I was doing wrong when I did it. When I was young, my early 20s, I would be driving down 82 and said, Lord, I'm going to do this. Lord, turn me around. Because I'm a fool. I ain't got good sense. I don't have a good mind without you, God. God, fix me. God, turn me around. Y'all looking at me like a cow looking at a brand new gate, but that's all right. That's right, don't move, don't shake, don't show that you've been there, done that. We ought to pray and talk to God and allow God to fix us and talk to us. And sometimes we need to stop moving in order to talk to him. Sometimes God trying to get our, our, our attention and we go and make a decision anyway. Oftentimes I ask people, they say, well, I'm going to pray about it. I asked them right point blank. Well, what God going to say? <laughs> because I can tell from the conversation they already have their mind made up. But I need to know from you what God is going to say so we can stop this counseling session now. <laughs> we wasting God's time. But when you honestly go before God and you honestly pray before him, you lay all your trash at the altar. And most of the time, it's in your private prayer. It just flat, can I just be honest? It just flat irks me when a person thinks that the, the prayer time at church is their time to lay everybody else's business and their business before the Lord. What did I just say? It just gets on my nerves. It's an irking situation. We ought to know how to pray, when to pray. We ought to know what to talk to God about because people will hold you hostage in the church. And I'm like, man, if you pray often, you won't have to pray so long. Matter of fact, pray as long as you want in your private chamber. Because the problem with America is America is not praying enough 
in our private chambers. Jesus says, don't be like the heathens. Don't be like the hypocrites with these long, drawn out prayers and with the same old thing over and over and over again. If we're going to pray the same prayers over again, over again, that portion of the prayer ought to be to honor God. God, we glorify you. Lord, we worship you. God, we love you. God, we adore you. Because everybody ought to have an interest point into their prayer. What's mine? Every single time. Somebody be saying in their mind, this is what he's going to say. Now, this is what he's going to say. Now, we don't know after he makes those first two statements what he's going to say. But we know what he's going to say in the first two statements. What is mine? What are mine? Oh, y'all don't pay attention. I do say in the name of Jesus. Of course, that she got hers in. Somebody else is telling her. Lord, it's in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I honor you for who you are. God, I thank you for just being God. Hallowed to your name. God, we bless you. God, we worship you. Because Jesus says we ought to pray that way. And that's before you ask him for anything. So the text, the text declares that he prayed to God always. Now is it, is it talking about he walked around praying 24 hours a day, in this case, 12 hours a day? Is that what he's talking about? No? What is he talking about then? The Bible said always. Was he talking about praying in his sleep? This means that he has a consistent prayer life. He has a consistent prayer life. I mean, I mean, you can tell when people pray. They don't cuss as quick as they used to. They don't get upset over every little thing. If you're still getting upset over the same things you got upset over last year, you're not growing. You ought to have some new things you get upset over. And even those things ought to be things that you are asking God, God fix me. I'm so glad we don't have any members of the New Beginning Church that says, you just got to put up with me where I am, Reverend. <laughs> this is just me. And you just got to put up with me. Thank God that God has delivered me from those type of members. I mean, it decreased the number of church members, but it decreased the headaches too. <laughs> and let me tell you, when I take Tylenol, I'm trying to get rid of a headache. And Sister Whitlock, I don't go back and pick that headache up again. Thank God for Tylenol. But thank God for removing the headaches. Hallelujah. Thank God for the members of the New Beginning Church. Thank you, Lord. No more headaches. No more chains holding me. Verse, number, verse number, number three, it says, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, you got to deal with the ninth hour. Is that nine o'clock? The ninth hour. What is our ninth hour? 9 a.m., right? The ninth hour of the day for us in America. 9 a.m., right? The ninth hour. Just the ninth hour of Wednesday morning is 9 a.m. The ninth hour. Yes? Or am I miscalculating? The day starts at midnight, right? The ninth hour. Boy, they count on their fingers. But when we read the Bible and it says the ninth hour, what time of day is this? Three, three afternoon, right? Three o'clock in the afternoon. That's why when you hear somebody say, when Jesus hung on Calvary, it became midnight at midday. 
because he hung from the sixth to the ninth hour. So it's six, the sixth hour, 12 o'clock. Three o'clock p.m., as we would say p.m., is the ninth hour. Because the clock that they went by had how many hours in a day? Who said so? What'd you say? Speak loud like you did last time when you thought you were sure. <laughs> so, so 3 a.m. or 3 in the afternoon, rather, 3 in the afternoon is the ninth hour. So at the, at the ninth hour, he falls into a vision, a trance. He falls into this trance. He sees an angel coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He's in a vision. An angel shows up at three in the afternoon. The reason why three in the afternoon is important because the Jewish religious folk was in prayer beginning at three in the afternoon. So theologians believe that God spoke to him in the midst of his prayers. What does that say to us? We need to talk to God. We need to pray in order so God can talk to us. God sends an angel. He calls his name Cornelius. Verse 4. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? In Acts, previous chapters, when did he run upon this same question or a similar question with this same uh, title, title, what is this, Lord? What do you want me to do, Lord? Yes, somewhere. What was the occasion? Hmm? Paul was on the Damascus road. Saul. Saul was on the Damascus road. Saul was on, I stand corrected. Saul was on the Damascus road, light shine, knocked, knocked Saul to the ground, and he asked the question, What will I have? What do you have me to do, Lord? In my Bible, in Acts chapter 10, the Lord is lowercase. In some versions, the word Lord is uppercase. You know it's what? Lowercase? How many lowercase in them? How many people got their Bibles open? All right. Your Bible or your device. So how many people got lowercase? How many people got uppercase? What version y'all read? NIV. King James. Okay. So when we look at this, whenever we see what we have, what we have for us to do, Lord, or me to do, Lord, it appears that the angel is a representation or a de delegate from the Lord. So the angel is speaking on God's behalf, and therefore he's speaking to the angel in order to talk to God. So it's, it's justified to have a lowercase Lord because Sarah called Abraham Lord. Now, Sister Barney, in my household, I've never been called Lord. <laughs> but the Bible says <laughs> that Sarah called Abraham Lord. Lord. She wasn't calling him God. No, it's not Matthew. It's Matthew. There's a difference. So he says, what is it, Lord? He's talking to the angel, through the angel, in order to talk to God. Theologian says he's in prayer. And he's, he's in a vision. 
How many of you have gotten so caught up in prayer that you can see what God is doing in the midst of your prayer? Let me back up so you won't get it wrong. I'm not talking about when you kneel down in prayer and you fell asleep. I'm not talking about you have done everything on planet earth and then at the end of the day you decide to talk to God and you find yourself getting up off the floor after you have fallen asleep. I'm not talking about that kind of trance. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm talking about you have gotten so intense with God until you can visualize what God is doing and what God is going to do. The Bible says that he was in a vision. He, he wanted to know what is it, Lord. The, the angel called his name. I have an exclamation point after Cornelius. The angel called his name, got his attention. And he wanted to know what is it, Lord. So he said to him, your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. He says, your prayer has been heard. He says, all of the arms that you have been given, God saw them and God approves of it. The Bible says that when the woman bowed down and took her hair and washed Jesus' feet, the Bible says that everywhere the word of God is preached, this woman ought to be recognized as a memorial to Jesus Christ. When you do something great, God does not forget it. And I'm not talking about great things that men measure as great. But when you do something for somebody else, you don't have to pass around and tell folk what you have done. God sees it. And check this out. God no only, not only sees the deed, God sees the heart of the one who does the deed. God knows your motives. Are you doing it so you can check off your box? Are you doing it so you can tell somebody about it? Are you doing it so somebody can do something for you? And let me tell you, don't bless folks so you can get blessed. It's your heart. It's your motive. God sees it and God recognizes it. So we got to work on our hearts. We have to work on the reason why we do things. How we do things. What's our motive? What's driving us to do it? Because guess what? If you do it with the wrong motive, Jesus says, keep it. Just forget about it. And if you do it for a reward on heaven, on earth, you can forget your reward in heaven. You've already received your reward. So, so the text says that God has heard your prayers. Your prayers and your arms have come up as a memorial before the Lord, before God. Let me just tell you something. When God, when we obey God, it's like a sweet smelling savor. When we talk to God, it's like a sweet smelling aroma in the nostrils of God. It's like when a parent goes to graduation, a parent goes to a wedding. I'm so proud of that boy. I'm so proud of that girl. Let me tell you, even at kindergarten graduation, you have parents screaming to the top of their lungs. God recognizes us. God sees us. God is blessed by what we do if we have the right motives. James said we would have been blessed, but we prayed amiss. We pray with the wrong motives. But the text says the angel reported to, to Cornelius, 
your prayers in your arms have come up before the Lord and God recognizes you and God approves of it. You bless the Lord and the Lord is blessing you. Verse 5. Now send men to Joppa. Where is Peter? He's in Joppa, right? Who is Peter with in Joppa? He's with Simon the Tanner. Simon Peter is with Simon the Tanner in Joppa. What's the occupation of Simon the Tanner? Were y'all here 20 minutes ago? He was? Thank you. Simon the Tanner is an undertaker, right? And so Peter is hanging out with the undertaker. Now the problem, the, 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 the ironic thing is, Darkus just has come back to life. Peter is given credit for God using him to bring Darkus back to life. But check this out. He's hanging out with the undertaker. Now Peter has just upset the undertaker's occupation. Peter has just brought a woman back to life. You think the undertaker ought to be glad about that? When you look at Mark chapter 5, there's a man running crazy in the graveyard. The people tried to shackle the man, he broke the chain. They tried to arrest him, he broke the handcuffs. Then when Jesus shows up in verse number, Mark chapter 5, verse number 6 says, when Jesus shows up, the man runs toward Jesus, bows down and worship him. Now the people get upset. It's kind of like the pastor. People complain over and over and over and over again about what's going on and what about, about what this person is doing. Pastor, you're going to have to do something about this. Then when he does something about it, pastor shouldn't have done him like that. Yeah, I like y'all never heard of that before. Thank y'all for being so sanctimonious. So it says, it says he sent men to Joppa and sent for Simon, whose surname is Peter. So did he send for Simon the tenth? No? Yes? Maybe so? He sent for Simon Peter whose surname is Peter, right? Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. That's key. His house is by the sea. His house is by the sea. He sends for Simon Peter who's lodging with Simon the Tanner. Simon Tanner's house is by the sea. Do you remember the guy who ran from God, didn't want to tell those heathens that God is going to do something, going to destroy you if you don't get it right? Who was he? Old Testament. Who was the preacher that refused to, to preach to this particular group of people? Jonah, right? Where did Jonah go? He went down to Joppa by the sea, down to Tarshish, got on a ship, went down into the ship. Whenever you leave the presence of God, you're on your way down. So, so he, he, he's, whose, whose house is by the sea, he will tell you what to do. He said, now go to Simon Peter. He will tell you what to do. Or will God tell you what to do? <laughs> my, my, my. He will tell you what to do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius did what the angel said to do. Look what Cornelius does. He calls for two of his household servants. In a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continuously. 
This word wait is the is the same word we get the word waiter. What does a waiter do? He serves. So he goes and he calls two of his household. Why can he have confidence in two people from his household? Why can he have confidence in these two people from his household who are servants? The unservants like slaves? Aren't you scared they're going to run off? No, because we read earlier that his whole household was righteous also. They had integrity. So he, got, he calls for two of the servants from his household, and he calls for a devout soldier. So look at Cornelius. So Cornelius has a good godly example in his household. And he has a good godly example. He, he, he models godliness even to his soldiers. Yes? So he goes and gets one devout soldier. Now, earlier we said that Cornelius was devout. Now he has a devout soldier. Let me tell you, your household ought to see you and they can model after you. I, I, I say to women all the time, if you want your husband to go to church just twice a month, you got to go every Sunday. If you want your husband to learn the word, you got to be in Bible study Sunday school. Because if he's going to attend twice a month, he got to see you modeling Christ the whole month. If you want your children to honor God, you have to show yourself devout before your children. See a woman in the grocery store just calling her children everything but children of God. I'm like, should I say something? And then I remember this is 21st century. <laughs> in the 20th century, Sister Brown, we could say something. But I remember this is the 21st century. But if your children going to be everything you dream of them to be, you have to make sure you paint a godly picture before them. Because believe it or not, as much as they say they're ready to get out of this house, whatever you teach them while they're in your house, that's what they're going to live by when they get out of your house. And yeah, they're going to crawl up or run up fool's hill, but the fact is they have something in them by which they can live. Cornelius was a devout man. He chose two from his household, two servants, and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continuously. So quite honestly, it's three different servants. If somebody's under him, he's serving him. The Bible says serve him continuously. If I'm going to send some men out from this church to represent this church, they have to be men of integrity, men who love the Lord. And that's why I call on the same men all the time. Isn't that something? I remember when I was at Bethel Stanley Church and and every project that came up, Pastor, I was just pushing on me. I mean, just giving it to me. One preacher came up with this wonderful idea. And he said, he said, uh, man, we can do this. We can do this for evangelism. So he brought it to me. I thought it was such a great idea. I take it to Pastor August and I give it to him. And he said, yeah, and you run it. I said, but, I said, but Pastor, he came up with it. He said, if you don't do it, we won't do it. And I had to become a pastor, Sister Brown, to understand what he was saying. I oftentimes say, I didn't agree with, nor did I understand Pastor Manson B. Johnson about 78% of the time. But I got a good understanding now. I didn't say I agreed, but I said I didn't understand. But I got a good understanding now. I didn't understand why the deacons handled everything. 
I got it. After I've gone through six, seven, eight, nine, ten preachers around here, I understand now. I understand arterial motives. I understand division among the brothers and the sisters. I understand now. And I can truly say before he closed his eyes, I understood. Hallelujah. So he, he took three men who were his servants. One of them was a devout soldier. All three of them, two of them were from his household. All three of them were men who feared, the God, feared God. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. 33 miles, they got a chance to run away. They got a chance to do what they wanted to do. They had a chance to sleep over somewhere. They had a chance to party, but he trusted them. Can God trust you? Can God trust you to be devout? Can God trust you with integrity, meaning that when no one is looking, you will do what is right? Can God trust you? Does, it, does, does the teacher have to assign a, a, a uh, class monitor every time he or she leaves the room? Does God have to assign a class monitor to you? And then you're looking at the brother and saying, snitches call stitches. <laughs> Snitchers get stitches. God is looking for somebody. Number one, Cornelius was a devout, righteous man. Number two, he trusted and he feared God. Number three, his household was one that he had modeled so much about Jesus. He had modeled Jesus Christ's plan so much to his whole household was devout and feared God. Then his occupation, his comrades, his colleagues, his friends, and his servants saw how he feared God and they feared God. So much so to the Lord says that the soldier was devout. And when you have a drill sergeant, when you have a drill sergeant, the last thing you see in a drill sergeant is a devout man. But you can even see those on the lower levels looking up to him and saying, that's a devout man. And when you have a devout man in charge, then you'll say, I'm going to do whatever I can to help him out. So he sends them. They go. And, and week after next, we'll talk about what they did when they went. Did they stop by the tavern? Did they get sloppy drunk? Did they lose their focus? Or did they go to Joppa? Did they go talk to Peter? Did Was Peter actually in Joppa? Was Peter where the Lord said he would be? You think Peter was there? The Bible says he was there. Was he there when they got there? If you read ahead, you got two whole weeks to read ahead. I didn't say we're going to be off two weeks. I said you have two weeks to read ahead. <laughs> and we want to know if they were devout and stayed devout. Some people are devout on Sunday. But follow them to their, their, where they work, they play, and they live on Monday. You see a totally different person. But because of Jesus, because of what he did on Calvary, because his death, burial, and his resurrection, we can be devout seven days a week. We can be devout 24 hours a day. We can stand for what is right. I didn't say we don't sin. I said we can stand for what is right, even if people are not looking at us. It's like an athlete that goes out and practice when practice did not meet that day. Kobe Bryant said that the big old boy was sorry because he didn't practice.
when nobody's looking. I, I remember we, we did a community service at the last job, last engineering firm I was at. We did a community service where we went to this place that gave away clothing and we had to cut these weeds that was about chest high. And we had to push lawnmowers and, and they were push mowers. We had to push line more to get the grass down. And then after we get the grass down, we had to come back and weed eat it. And I remember a supervisor who was out there working with us. He had short pants on, so you knew he wasn't doing much. But when the manager showed up, he, he put his left eye on the manager and started weed eating and going closer and closer to the manager so the manager could see him weed. I saw it in living color. I want to say, if he wasn't a supervisor, I would have said, man, you ain't done nothing all day and you ain't doing nothing now. It's because when you have the right motive, God can bless you wherever you are, regardless of who your supervisor is, regardless of what goes on around you. Do the right thing at the right time with the right motive and watch God move in a mighty way. Because Jesus died for you and rose for you. The door of the church is open. Amen. Just as Cornelius was righteous, he set a godly example. It is our turn to set a godly example. It is our opportunity to get to know Jesus in a better light. And for those of us who are not saved, who are not born again, you can be saved right here tonight. Right where you are, regardless if you're on the airwave or in present. You can be saved right here, right now. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, bow your head with me, please. And invite Jesus into your life to be your Savior. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, inviting Jesus Christ into your life, you are born again. And once you're born again, you're born again from now on. But you need to be in a good Bible teaching church. And I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus Christ is the center of attention. And he is the main attraction. If you want to join our church or you have reached, reached out to Jesus tonight and Jesus has saved you, let us know. Inbox us and let us know that life has been made different for you. If you've committed your life to Christ as Cornelius has, being a devout man, being a righteous man, having a godly example, let us know that God is operating in your life. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. Please join us every Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. every Wednesday night. And then join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school and 10.30 a.m. on Sunday for our worship service. We'll be glad to have you come and worship with us. We are at 4251 Shiramai Road. 4251 Shiramai Road. Shiramai is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. 77048 USA. Thank you for joining us. We are praying. We are praying uh, for those on our, our prayer list. We are praying that God continue to, to bless them all this week and next week. I'm going to say this week and next week. Let's continue to pray for the Whitlocks at noonday every day 
at noon day. We're praying for the Whitlocks that God will continue to do great things in their lives and, and that we will have some amen running around here, hollering and screaming and crying. Amen. Sam, what stop that girl? We need we need children to keep us young. I'm telling you, if you try to chase some children, you'll stay young. You don't have to go to the gym, just have some children. So we we praying for the Whitlocks that, that God will give them favor, that God will uh, give a miracle, and that God will will give wisdom. So that is that is 14 days from Sunday, from this past Sunday, 14 days. Let's lift up the Whitlock at noonday. At noonday. All of us want to bombard heaven at noonday. Wherever you are, stop for a moment, meditate for a moment, thank God for blessing blessing them and ask God to do it as only he can. Amen. So let's do that for 14 days, 14 days. Mondays, we started Monday, we started Monday. We were looking for 14 days, 14 days after this past, what is this, two days ago we started. So we want to continue to lift the Whitlocks before the Lord and, and watch what God does. Let me tell you, God can do anything, anything but fail. Anything but fail. Anything but fail. Sister David says that New Beginning Church needs a miracle. Needs. We need some. We need some children around here. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're praying for the for the Whitlocks and we're praying that God do great things as well as those others who are on our prayer list. We're, we're praying that God continue to, to prove that he is God. He is He is. God alone. Let me tell you, we are not only in the history making, uh, in the in the Senate, in the Congress, in the in the State House. We are in history making at the New Beginning Church. We are in the, in the business. God is making history. We we are making history, y'all. We are making history. If you would believe with me, I believe God. God will bless us. Amen. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. We honor God because it's a blessing to give to Him. It's an honor to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a blessing to give to the Lord. For those of you who want to give by way of electronics means, you can do so by giving by way of our Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting dot jesus at yahoo.com lifting dot jesus at yahoo.com if you want to mail in your gift you can do so by mailing it to p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 that is p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 Thank God for the opportunity to give. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for every giver. We thank you for every gift. We ask the blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. Let us stand to be dismissed. Follow Jesus. He has a plan. Take it to the top. Sing, Sister Davis. Everybody else will sing if you sing. Father God, for who you are and for what you do. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father God, that we can be devout people, that we can be righteous, that we can fear the Lord. And Lord, we fear you today. God, we love you. We bless your name. We come now lifting up everybody on our prayer list, Father God. Those who have not given their names to us, Lord, you know. And we ask you to bless in the name of Jesus. 
We thank you for the Whitlock family. We thank you for increasing their family. We thank you, Father God, for blessing them and continue to walk with them. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to deliver as only you can. We know you as God, the creator. We pray that you create a miracle. We pray that you give us wisdom, knowledge, and Lord, we ask you to amaze the doctors. Blow their mind, Father God. Bless the technicians to see you in the midst of miracles. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Bless our church that our church will continue to grow financially, grow spiritually, and grow numerically. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.